Under there now, the 1994 Renko Show! Here we go. The appetite for holidays in Britain and Europe grew rapidly during the first half of the 20th century. A practical and economic solution to this was to create self-contained holiday zones. For the first time, large numbers of people could be given a holiday away from home at a price they could afford, and in an environment that was dedicated to offering what for most was an entirely new experience, organized leisure. Over the years, the pioneers of this particular form of tourism, such as Butlins in Britain and the Club Mediterranean in France, have had to adapt to great social and cultural changes. Their story is central to the tradition of the communal holiday. Before the war in particular, before even Butling, for example, got underway, there was a fair range of different types of holiday camp. There were vegetarian camps, there were political camps, there were good living camps, there were athletic camps, there were Quaker camps. Oh, goodness me. Orwell had a great swipe at them, if you remember. I think it's in Wigan Pier where he talked about uh, all these vegetarian Nancy boys in their shorts with knobbly knees. <laughs> and you knew what he meant. There were some lovely pictures of George Bernard Shaw in his knickerbockers holding forth at these camps. But nearly all of them, and this is the point, they were camps where they sort of purpose. There was a hidden agenda or an explicit agenda. And therefore, they were largely middle class, or the, but the, but the least lower middle class, because Working class people on the whole didn't have ideological reasons for going away. I think in the 1990s we must refrain from using the word camp because we like to be anything else other than the word camp. So we call ourselves a leisure hotel, really. We're at Hopton on Sea, midway between Great Yarmouth and Dursdorf. And uh, we're at our, Judy and Brian's, uh, privately owned holiday centre on the east coast and uh, we're sitting in our 35 acres down to the sea. Grandfather um, obtained the idea from um, holidaying at Caister Camp which was then under canvas. I think in the era it was then very very much a staunch and I never like to get political but it was a very staunch socialist gathering and father, or grandfather, should I say, was a staunch socialist. And he went there and enjoyed the fun and games in that people in that era went out and picked their own vegetables in the fields and they brought them back and in front of the campfire they had sing songs and inspired with the idea of all the camaraderie and the fun and games, which was all very much part and parcel of the industry. Um, he became um, enthused and uh, started the very first holiday camp. I use the word in the context and that it started in 1920 with timber huts. There used to be a camp train and a station in Hopton then. Um, we used to be met by Jeff, the organiser, with a little band and march you through the village singing the camp song. You remember that? With a trolley with your luggage on. John. <laughs> Did we really do all that? <laughs> yeah. A Friday night, the bonfire on the beach. Oh, well, that was very the, the long night while before ago. every, if mm. the weather permitted, a huge bonfire, sing song round mm. it, yeah. lovely. I don't remember Great. that. No, no. You don't. No. 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 I was probably in bed. <laughs> But I can remember the pigs on the bottom oh, of the field. Yes, they yeah. used to breed their own pigs yeah. and um, slaughter them, I think, for the yeah. bacon. And, and coming from London to see the piglets 
I thought it was wonderful, sort of, you know. And they were fed by the scraps, uh, scraps from the yeah. kit, from the kitchen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? The things you remember. The number of smaller holiday camps, such as Potter's, continued to grow during the 20s and 30s. But even by the 1950s, the vast majority of people continued to spend their annual holiday in the traditional seaside boarding house. We went to painting quite a lot. And if you're in a guest house and after breakfast they want you out, you know, and they don't want to see you again to the evening meal. I mean, Olive and I have sat in the on deck the... chairs with our top coats on, <laughs> on the beach, like, you yeah, know, but they didn't time. want to see you. Yeah. And, and beyond that, I mean, that's how Billy Butlin started this thing, isn't it? He saw people huddled in shelters, in bus shelters. Out the rain and, and he know, thought, well, this yeah. can't be so, you know, this can't be right. And that's where his ideal came from, to open up these camps so that there was something for them, they were undercover, there was plenty of entertainment, you know. He started off in the fur grass with the hoopla storm, and he found that by making his rings larger than anybody else's, where they won more prizes, but then he got a lot more customers. Then I suppose he was looking at the crowds of people going through the fur grounds, what did they do? And nearly always a fur ground was on a seafront, and he was staying in some of the um, boarding houses himself, where the people had to get out, and I think that all connected up. Hello, dear. Well, this shirt, we've got holidays with pay, isn't it? Woo! Isn't that lovely? Holidays with pay. Who says the world doesn't progress? <laughs> Not every business pays this premium yet, but a beginning has been made and what has long been the privilege in offices will become the rule in factories. Anyway, the holiday exodus has begun, so a happy time to all of you. The uh, Holidays with Pay Act was actually passed in 1938, but uh, not put into effect until after the war. Um, this is where Butlin comes on the scene because uh, he had this slogan, a week's holiday for a week's pay. The, the, the number of people who went away on holiday after war doubled. It was something like 30 million people going away. And uh, I think Butlin's alone turned away 200,000 people in, in, in that holiday peak period. talking about cancelled 10, 12,000 people. Saturdays were apparently a logistical nightmare. You had something like five, 6,000 people arriving with suitcases standing around, queuing, filling in forms, being taken to their chalet. Meanwhile, at the other end of camp, another five or 6,000 were leaving. Uh, so the whole thing really was, was a bit like a military operation. Billy Butlin opened his first holiday camp in 1936 at Skegness. He sensed there was something wrong after about three days into the operation. The campers were not mixing. So he called upon a chap called Norman Bradford. Now Norman, he said, pop out to Skegness and purchase a blazer. Norman came back and he found a yellow one, a white one and a blue one. Billy was still unhappy about this blazer. He wanted something bright and cheerful. He said, go out again and have a blazer made up in red. And he did. 
following day, Norman went on the stage wearing the now famous red jacket, white flannels. Good morning, Canvas. And everybody shouted back, good morning. He got it. Billy shuddered with excitement. The red coat was born. When I was a child, the red coats were my role models. I was infatuated with them, if you like. I used to come on holiday. I used to love to see the red coats. I used to get all their autographs. And uh, to me, they were the most important thing of my whole year, you know, that holiday at Butlins and just to see the red coats. And it was just been my ambition to be a, to be a red coat, and here I am. I think um, the uh, red coat's job is still very much to break the ice. But you'd be surprised when people are on holiday, especially at a Butlins, they come and they'll join in where normally they wouldn't in everyday life. Everybody thinks, well, what the heck? I won't see any of these people ever again after Saturday, so we might as well. I first got involved with the holiday camp world uh, when I was a student at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and I knew a chap who knew a chap who knew the entertainment's manager at Butlin's holiday camp, and the headquarters was in Oxford Street. There was a man named Wally Goodman, long since dead and gone, and I went up and to see him. He said, what do you do then, son? I said, I'm a student at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, you know, put it on a bit. And he said, oh, he said, I could do with you. He said, we like uh, red coats with posh voices. Everybody wanted to get up and do a turn. He would say, come on, join in. Uh, who can hold their heads under the water longest without drowning competition? And one of them called, yes, that's my bum. You would not believe this. And there were, instead of having the gl most glamorous grandmother or the most beautiful ankle competition, they had all holes and people stuck their bums through. Yes, it's the, yes, folks, it's the, that's my bum competition. Everybody wanted to have fun, and I think the whole keynote of this is fun. Now, the rules are very simple. Whichever team stuffs the most spaghetti down the trousers is the winner. Ready, steady. Our family was poor but respectable and we wouldn't have touched butlins and we wouldn't have wanted to join in the knees of mother browns or whatever and then after the war i became an adult education tutor to the workers education association and we had another suspicion of the butlins things we thought they had a, a vaguely sinister edge in that they persuaded people that were happy as the war when they're doing fairly mindless things in large crowds and we were very earnest and moral and all the rest of it, and we didn't approve of that. It's all very well for people to stand on the sidelines and say, well, you know, you, this is taking away people's individuality and it's regimented and everything else. But one has, one has to think back to really what a big step it was to make that first holiday. Uh, the end of the 1930s, even into the 1940s, there were families that didn't own a suitcase, families that never made arrangements to leave their house before. What do you do with a cat? What do you do with auntie next door? All these kinds of things. And it was a great adventure. And, and the great formula that Butlins and others offered was that they, uh, they, they would provide a program. They would provide that first step. Yeah, our first one was at Clacton. And, uh, oh, that was quite an experience, really, because we'd been used to a... We had gone to a small camp before, but when we went there, it was so huge.